Welcome to Diffused Congruence. This is episode five of the American Muslim Experience. I'm your host, Zaki Hassan, and I'm joined by my co-host, once again, Pervez Ahmed. Great to be here, Zaki. I'm really excited about this particular episode and the guest we have today. So why don't you... uh so give us a little idea of uh, who we'll be speaking with today. Well, our guest for, for this episode five is Dr. Munir Farid, who is a respected scholar and thought leader of the Muslim community in North America. He's currently a member of the FIC Council of North America, the premier Islamic legal authority in the United States and Canada. Dr. Farid is a co-founder, core scholar, and member of the Board of Trustees of the American Learning Institute for Muslims, a.k.a. Alim, an academic institution where scholars, professionals, Activists, artists, writers, and community leaders come together to develop strategies for the future of Islam in the modern world. Previously, Dr. Farid has served as the Secretary General of the Islamic Society of North America, ISNA, Associate Professor of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies at Wayne University, Wayne State University, excuse me, in Detroit, Michigan, and Scholar in Residence of the Islamic Association of Greater Detroit. Dr. Farid is a graduate of the King Abdulaziz University uh, in Mecca, in Saudi Arabia of Darul Uloom Dioband and the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he earned his doctorate in Islamic studies. Dr. Farid currently lives in South Africa, where he is the Associate Professor of Islamic Studies at the University of Cape Town. So that is a very lengthy introduction to a very prestigious presence who we're very honored to have with us. So thank you, uh, Dr. Farid, for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. So, you know, I mean, as Zaki was uh, read off that long uh, uh, background to you and your story. Um, uh, you've had a very varied background, and you come from a very va- varied background. I, I was wondering if you could talk, perhaps, a little bit about, um, you know, just telling us about, you know, what what sort of led you into, uh, I guess, the sort of academic study of Islam. Uh, was it something that you were interested in at a young age? Was it something that was sort of in the, you know, in in, in the DNA? Uh, tell us a little bit about what led you to the study of Islam. To the study of Islam, uh, yeah, well, I uh, I come from a tradition of, of Muslim leaders, so to speak, uh, and uh, those who migrated to South Africa in the 17th, 18th centuries did so for two or three reasons. As the first batch that came in were actually political prisoners uh, who were resisting the British or the Dutch in Southeast Asia. Mm. which is today Malaysia uh, and, more accurately, Indonesia. And uh, then uh, there were others who came in from India, uh, and uh, they were incarcerated as uh, slaves, actually. Mm. Um, About a hundred years after that, uh, the British established a a sugarcane industry uh, on the east coast of South Africa, and so they brought in indentured laborers, slave laborers, basically, uh, from South Asia, from South Asia, South India. And uh, so that was the first wave from, from India. Uh, the second wave comprised the uh, trader community from Gujarat and these areas who, uh, uh, who moved in next. And that was followed by preachers. So my family came in the third lot. Mm-hmm. So with regard to DNA, it goes that far back. Wow. And, and, and I, I hadn't even sort of contemplated or thought about wanting to, you know, taking the conversation into some of the roots of uh, the, the, the migrational roots and, and, and the community, the Indian community that settled in South Africa. But I think that's a great, that's also a great conversation. I'd love to sort of flesh that out a little, a little bit more as well. Uh, so when you talk about the third wave, um, are you talking about your grandfather? or Great grandfather immigrated to... Uh, South Africa. To the East Coast, that's right. That's and then right. he established mosques and Islamic centers uh, throughout South Africa. Was there already a standing Muslim community there? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Islam in South Africa yeah. goes back to the 17th century. Okay. Uh, these were the slaves, like I mentioned previously, who had moved there, or uh, uh, forcibly uh, removed from Indonesia Okay. and uh, imprisoned in South Africa. Right. right. And the first Quran uh, was written by from memory, uh, by slave, like by slaves, by a sheikh who was who was in prison. That's right. Uh, these 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 people were slaves in in, in a political sense. Uh, they were political prisoners, and uh, uh, 
in, in their countries of origin, uh, they held very high positions, which is why the British wanted them to be physically removed, mm. unless they constitute a threat to their dominance over Southeast Asia. Ah, so it's much more political in nature uh, than, say, the transatlantic slave route that happens That's here right. in the Americas. That's right. That's right. Right, okay. So they came in highly educated and highly skilled. Mm. But they were robbed of some of that, uh, again, whatever back, like whatever positions they held back. Oh, they were robbed yeah. of everything. Right. Their, their, their families, right. their identities, uh, uh, they, they have simply had their lives to live in, in a country, in a part of the world that was was inhabited by Africans, by, uh, but not, uh, not by immigrants. Okay. So they, the whites and, and, and Indonesians and Indians were the, were the pioneers of, to establish. And so therefore, you, if you look at the Afrikaans language, for instance, yeah. uh, it has elements of the Dutch language in it. It also has elements of Indonesian language. Oh. So uh, 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 a saucer, you know, you have a cup and a saucer. Mm -hmm. in, 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 in Afrikaans, it's called a piram, <laughs> and that is actually Indonesian. And so the um, and then with regards to the, uh, the British colonial presence, that obviously predates all of this. Or are we talking fifteenth, sixteenth century? No, no. This, this, uh, the, the Dutch were the first to move in. There was there was the a clash of colonial powers within South Africa. Okay. Because the Dutch moved in initially. Okay. The unfounded be around sixteen fifty two, I think. Right. And then the British tried to dislodge them, so that became the British uh, Boer War the English Boer War. And, and uh, that, that's a fascinating saga in South African history. Hmm. Uh, when, when you look at the, the, uh, the Mayflower and, and, and the movement of the Europeans to America, during that, exactly around that time, there was a wave south as well. Okay. So you might have had, I don't know, I don't have evidence for this, you might have had brothers moving to the west and brothers moving to the south. Mm -hmm. uh, establishing colonies. Right. Uh, so some of those those French Huguenots who moved to South Africa uh, had the siblings, perhaps, who moved to to, to America. Mm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so I mean, of of the many different roles that you've played, I mean, just we we went through uh, sort of a, we we bounced off of those in in the intro. Um, which which would you say you found the most challenging, most rewarding, or is there? I think being Secretary General of, of ESNA was the most challenging. And and why is that? Well, because it's a national organization for one, and so the, your your footprint is much much larger. And because ESNA actually operates at the at the fringes of of, of the Islamic American communities, it 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 uh, it operates like a bridge. Uh, of communications between Muslims and Jews and Muslims and Christians, uh, the Islamic community and the, and and the U.S. government, the State Department, and so your 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 conversations are therefore somewhat more uh, nuanced, more complicated. You're different. You're not just dealing with a single religion. You're dealing with multiple religions. You're not dealing with a single political. Uh, entity you're dealing with uh, issues that are both national and global uh, and then ISNA is also uh, in transition between the old immigrant community and the new immigrant community and so you have uh, you have your your grandfather who established the MSA perhaps 40 or 50 or 60 years ago uh, not wanting to let go hmm. And his grandchildren who moved into the Bay Area, uh, not wanting to have anything to do with these these antiquated institutions, mm. and and so it's not therefore to that extent is is the story of Islam in America unfolding, as opposed to every other organization which is perhaps either a chapter in that book or a footnote. The book itself is primarily Isna. And and just from what you're describing, ISNA kind of exists at the nexus of this generational transition. Absolutely. And and how 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 is that how is that transition being manifested in your experience? Uh, very awkwardly. Hmm. 
not unlike uh, the conversations that go on in almost every Muslim home. And I'm, here I talk about the immigrant community because the African American community has a very different narrative. Sure. But within the within the 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 the, the, uh, the immigrant home, there is this conversation of about what it means to be Muslim, what it means to to uh, to be loyal to one's ancestry, what it means to to uh, to live one's culture, what it means to to give up culture. Uh, what it means to be Hanafi, what it means to be non-Hanafi. So these are conversations that go on in every Muslim home. And, uh, and uh, so at a, at, a, at a national level, I think that that is reflected in the conversations that go on within ISNA. And, and, and I, I want to circle back around to ISNA, but would you say that the, the conversations that you're alluding to that occur, you know, the, the, sort of the, the conversations about, about Islam's place in America, is, is that a unique conversation to America or is that a conversation that's the same whether we're talking about Europe? No, I think it's unique to America. There may, there may be similarities with pockets of, of, of Muslims in, in Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, Germans might be having that conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, but but America poses its own challenges. And and what are those challenges? Uh, it's uh, we are a minority within a minority within a minority. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we are we are not white, which is the dominant racial minority uh, 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 racial uh, structure in in this country. Uh, so that makes us a minority. Hmm. Uh, we are not Christian. We're Muslims, so that makes us a minority. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are, we are not, we are not entirely at peace with, with America, and that makes us a minority within a minority. America is at war with countries in the world, and in every one of those countries, Islam plays a, a dominant role. Uh, America's entanglement with with its warring factions outside uh, is is influenced to to a lesser or greater extent by by religion, and in this case, it is Islam. So ours is is perhaps the most complicated relationship in this country. So I mean, I I actually want to. Go back a little, yeah, um, because I mean, I you know, I, I, and 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 then we'll cut, like you said, we'll circle back to not only Isna but perhaps this conversation. Um, so I want to I want to sort of go back to you then growing up within the milieu that you described of uh, of, of the uh, of the Indian community in South Africa um, when you uh, came of age and you wanted to study Islam again uh, in any type of a setting, whether academically or what have you. What um, led you to choose India as the place to begin your studies, and why? Well, India was not where I began studying. Okay, sorry. Saudi Arabia was. Aha, uh-huh. okay. Uh, so I went to Saudi, Saudi Arabia. I, I uh, initially enrolled at the University of Medina, and then switched to Mecca. Okay. And so uh, I did my studies there. And then uh, decided to go to South Asia. Uh, I, I grew up in a community that, uh, that was serviced by, by uh, uh, ulama who were largely graduates of Saudi Arabia. But I also lived for, 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 for much of my life uh, in a community that was serviced by people who graduated from the Middle East. Uh, and I was, I would think, ideologically attuned initially mm. to those who were graduates from the Middle East, mm. uh, and uh, only in, in actually uh, engaging in Islamic studies mm-hmm. and and uh, understanding uh, the the development of Islamic thought did I see need for me to spend time in South Asia, okay. and uh, yeah, it's so when you narrow it down to South Asia, then Darul Ulum becomes this sort of. The, it's the Oxford, you right. know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, the Oxford of, 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 of South Asia in Correct. terms of Islamic studies. Right. So it was, uh, it was the logical choice. Right. In fact, it was established initially, the irony of the Obund is that it was styled initially by the, by the pioneer, uh, who was Qasim Nanotwi, mm-hmm. and he had uh, in mind an institution in, 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 
in England, and it was called Oxford, the University of Oxford, exactly. Mm. He called, now, not he himself was a graduate of Delhi College, so he was exposed to, to Western thought. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, he, he was looking to establish something similar. I'm a little rusty with my own my own history here, but where does the, like the the, the Ferengi Mahel and where, where does that those play? are th- those those okay. are different strands. The different strands, okay. Yeah, they're parallel strands, but they're different. As as different or parallel as say the Nadwat al Ulama and and, and that's that closer. To, that, that, that's that's much much closer to Dioband. Right. Uh, okay. Ferengi you, Mahel is about is about a step removed, and 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 then a. a, a, a a strand that is that is uh, at odds with the Oban in some ways, but not in, in, in all, would be say Braille, the, the Braille group, or the the Ahl Hadith, which in, in, in the Arabic world, uh, Arab world would be called the Salafi group. That's right. Uh, so these are these are the various strands of Islamic thought okay. right. and Islamic learning in South Asia. Okay. So again, going back partic- in, in speaking particularly about the Oban, um, then and Darul Ulum. Um, in terms of the student body and and the, and the makeup, or in fact, frankly, even the faculty, uh, how how diverse, whether it's uh, ideologically, uh, whether it's uh, demographically, oh, it's largely homogenous. I mean, okay. those who those who teach at Dioban are yeah. graduates of either the institution itself, uh-huh. which is which would be their preference, right, and or someone who 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 graduated from a sister institution. Within that, within within the 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 the, 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 the orbit, uh, students will also be largely students who are who are ideologically or or traditionally tied to the Right, and that's I mean we're we're talking just South Asia. We're, we're looking at the South oh, Asian. The Oband is unique in that it long before the Middle East yeah. is, uh, or. Perhaps not every institution, because the Azhar would would would, would be older in that regard. But the Uband was one of, one of those institutions that was able to attract uh, students from Malaysia, Indonesia, certain from South Africa, and mm. then as as Indians moved into England, <laughs> lots of them came to the Uband to grow, to to study. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay. So then, fast forwarding a little bit, then. So then you are uh, then. Um, uh, invited by the community in Michigan and, Det- and you know, um, uh, the outskirts of Detroit to come and serve as their imam. So how was that transition now? You're coming. Well, it's the first time I'm, I'm actually serving a community in that capacity. Right. And I was very fortunate in having a community that, uh, that allowed me, uh, to, uh, to, to share my view of, of Islam uh, with them and allowed me to to grow and help me do that. Okay. Uh, it's it was it was a relationship that was very compatible, uh, and which which uh, in 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 America, or perhaps even in the world, is is a rarity. Uh, for the most part, the relationship between the imam and 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 his flock is is uh, can prove to be problematic. Hmm. In, in in my case, that was not so. Uh, was can, that because can you, of, you know, uh, elaborate on that a, a little bit? The idea of of it of it potentially being problematic. Well, imams want to want to pursue a particular ideal mm-hmm. uh, that the, the community should be molded to reflect society as it existed, either in in the home country mm-hmm. or as it existed in in the text. Okay, the ideal community. Sure. Whereas, whereas the flock, the community itself, they have careers to pursue, mortgages to pay, and the mortgage itself is problematic. Uh, they have to graduate from college. They have light bulbs, electricity. They have to live their lives. Right. And, and you, can, you, you only live your life by, by negotiating and compromising your ideals. Right. And, and this has always been the case. It has, and, and, and imams are also... Uh, 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 not cognizant of the fact that even the early Muslims at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they lived this life of, of compromise mm. Mecca was a life of compromise Medina was a life of compromise 
uh, you're living in a sea of, of disbelief. Mm-hmm. So you can't exercise your your ideals entirely. Right. Uh, you couldn't do it in Makkah because of, of, of because you lived as a minority. You couldn't do it in Medina because you had to overcome the the, the tribal links. You had to overcome the hypocrites. The whole the whole saga with the hypocrites is a saga of compromise and adjustments and com- and and and, and uh, realignments. If our history is looked at in that way, then the imams would be better qualified and better trained to deal with the realities of life in San Jose, California. Right. Mm. So in, in your experience, having done this, what did you find was the key to being an effective imam for a, a community? Uh, um, well, having an open mind, whatever that means, uh, <laughs> and wanting to to learn, and not and knowing that uh, that uh, you are not uh, adequately adequately equipped to to uh, to address the needs of the community, hmm. which which then then puts you on a particular learning curve, right? Curve, right. And right. and 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 I think that's perhaps the most important right. ingredient needed for an imam to 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 function effectively. Right. Because you're identifying a much more symbiotic relationship between the imam and the flock there, where you're learning as much about them, them, their needs. And in this case, the context within, uh, you know, the context of America, which is also rel- would be new to you at that time. Um, so, yeah. That, that's so it, not, not, it's not about shaping them to a pre-existing right. mold that you have in your mind. It's about you. Well, it, it. you, you set out that way. Right. Sure. And if you're not able to, to, to overcome that, then then you either lose your job or take your community into some kind of a, 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 an, ins, a, an insularity a, a, that that uh, that gives it uh, um, gives it some a semblance of Islamicity, and you end up becoming a quasi Amish community. Yeah, you know. And 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 that and you see that happen in so many. In fact, the, the, uh, I, I, it would be wonderful if somebody undertook studies of Muslims who've gone Amish. I know of a community in 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 in, in Michigan City uh, that that has been doing this. They have a a a, a sheikh uh, from some part of Pakistan mm. uh, who helped them establish this community. The irony, of course, is that they're largely African American. But 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 they but they live these this insular life uh, separate from 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 the community at large. And by 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 the community, they, I mean both the American community as well as the greater Muslim community. Right. So 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 these are fascinating uh, pockets uh, throughout America. Yeah. Uh, you have you have you have uh, communities within communities like in in New York City, for instance. Mm-hmm. You'll find that there are entire communities that are that are almost cut off. From the greater community, right? I, I saw uh, a community firsthand, uh, Imam Jamil's community uh, in, in uh, Atlanta. When you talk about a community within a community, uh, very again, very uh, not isolated is not the word. Like you, uh, there's a better word that you used, but insulated. Uh, but yeah, that that's true. Um, versus, I guess, being much more um, like trying to m- make an attempt to integrate absolutely effectively. Um, now, I, you know, like you, you said, you know, Isna being a story of Islam in America. What I find, in, you know, in terms of the story of Islam in America, I find it also fascinating that the place that you happen to be invited to and come to within, you know, in terms of America is is Michigan. Because I think Detroit and greater Michigan and the communities that surround Detroit uh, present a very, almost a microcosm of the story of Islam in America. Because you have this... You have the inner city, Detroit, and the struggles within, and the the, the indigenous African American Muslim community that existed prior to the immigrants coming, the immigrant community that establishes itself as, as satellites after the white flight that happens in Detroit, um, and there are largely professionals, edu- highly educated, highly socially mobile. So the community that you then serve as imam of is rather affluent, uh, predominantly not predominantly. Is, 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 is an immigrant community with uh, young children. Um, so I, I, want, I want you to speak a little bit about that in terms of, you know, you, that community within the context of Detroit and the, the, the story of 
Detroit and the store and and well, my, my extension my, is my, South my being in Detroit was was purely coincidental. Of course, but South yeah. African community, family happened to live out there. I see. And 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 mosque needed an imam, and they said, "Well, we, well, we know someone in South Africa." Okay, so they knew someone who knew someone, and that's how I got there. Right. <laughs> uh, and and uh, so I I knew little about about the community in Detroit and. Perhaps a little about America itself, Islam in America, right? And uh, so, so what you describe is is something that I can look back in retrospect, right? And that's what I—that's my point. Uh, I, I, yeah. it's, it's not something that that stared me in the face. Hmm. Uh, uh, you know, it's you move into a community uh, that is that is foreign to you in two ways. Even the Muslim community, you there's certainly certain similarities. There are certain similarities. Uh, but then, uh, but there are also some some serious differences. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the American community is is. I, I certainly didn't have the culture shock that a South Asian or a Middle Eastern imam or alim would have, because I'm South African and I grew up in a community that is uh, entirely Western, mm-hmm. and so we were able to 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 negotiate that and develop a modus operandi in South Africa, and that's what people found attractive about having people like myself here. Yeah, as, as Muslim leaders, because we had established and negotiated a relationship with with with, with Western society. That's right. Uh, but uh, but America is 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 different from South Africa, even even in terms of 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 uh, dealing with minorities and 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 dealing with religion. Uh, I came from a, from a country that was beset by apartheid, and uh, to a country where where. Uh, legal apartheid was 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 banned, uh, but but apartheid was pervasive in 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 so many other ways. De facto, and yeah. and and, uh, hmm. and so it took me a while to to come to the realization that the fact that African Americans live south of Eight Mile Road, see that's and important. South Asians live in Hamtramck, and Arabs live in Dearborn, hmm. and whites live everywhere else. That that is actually not normal. Right. That's what uh, that is, that's what, I guess what I was trying to say in terms of the fact that you happen to you know your introduction to America being the greater Michigan you know the greater Detroit Michigan community is fascinating because of the reasons that you're that that, that you're getting into right now. So in a sense, Detroit reflected uh, uh, South Africa, right? right. Hmm. And uh, it still does. It still does. Yeah. Uh, but the but the flip side of that is that the, the the Muslim community in Detroit is generally the most harmonious uh, community that I that I can think of. I mean, they they work very well, even though they live in these these separate pockets. Uh, they they co- they cooperate, they communicate, and uh, apart from the from the occasional. Um, conflagration between Sunnis and Shiites in Dearborn. For the most part, uh, there's there's little uh, disharmony there. Uh, the same can't be said for some other parts of of right of, of America. Uh, so so that that's very interesting. Now, when you said it was like South Africa, did you mean the way in which you, you know you have these uh, very ghettoized communities? Like the Arabs in Dearborn, the Bangladeshis in Hamtramck, uh, the people from the subcontinent. Well, 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 if it's ghettoized, then there's a minority that there's a majority that 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 dominates both space and culture, and a minority that that finds an enclave within that. Mm-hmm. Uh, here, you're talking about the entire city of Detroit uh, being separate. Mm-hmm. Sure. So there's there's a, a sizable number of people who who consider themselves black, who live south of Eight Mile Road, and right. uh, so it's 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 not, it's not quite, it doesn't quite fit the the that that particular profile. But maybe the, maybe, maybe compartmentalized is a yeah bit yeah, which is what apartheid is. It's 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 right. communities that are separated uh, and 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 uh, in terms of of space, right. but they are also they are also. Uh, 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 stratified hmm. in terms of privileges, right? So, and that is true for Detroit as well. So, so those who are affluent live in in and also happen to be white, 
Sure. Much like in South Africa, those who are affluent also happen to be white, and they also happen to 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 occupy uh, the, the, the 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 most expensive real estate in both countries. So it took me a while to understand that. Well, it's not supposed to be like that in this country, hmm. uh, because it is because it is uh, egalitarian, democratic. It's not. It's not. It's not predicated on. On apartheid, South Africa is. South Africa was constitutionally based on apartheid. Sure. Right. It was the legal framework of, of the country. So w- was that jarring for you to come from yeah. a place where that was the norm from a, from a societal point of no, view? No, it was not jarring. It took me a while to realize that, th- that this, is not the, this is not the norm. Okay. You mean America should not be this it way? Should okay. not be. Right. But, should but in your South Africa is 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 uh, is that way by uh, design. De jure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, de jure. And this here you saw it de facto. That's right. Is, but is is that still the case in South Africa in your, in your experience? We are not talking about South Africa. We are talking about America being abnormal. Sure. Right, right. Uh, for that, for South Africa, that was normal. The sure. entire country was that, that was the legal basis for the country. Right, right. South Africa is now one of the most integrated sure. and, 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 and that was the square, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's so I mean that's that's right. that's a different South Africa today. Yeah. Right. But I, so I'm, I'm more interested but, but but it's still stratified uh, in, in, in economically. Yeah. Right. And 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 spatially in the same way. Uh, it's it's not like you will, you know, you, you're going to create a, a new kind of of, of, of injustice mm-hmm. uh, if you if you if you dispossess people sure. who have acquired real estate and acquired uh, uh, material uh, trappings mm-hmm. uh, simply because they're white. Sure. Right. But so now okay. comparing the coming from an Indian Pakistani or let's say Indian community in South Africa. Then serving as imam to a largely Indian Pakistani flock, and then where they rank vis-a-vis white privilege and what have you in Michigan versus where Indian Pakistanis ranked in South Africa, compare the two. I mean, was that that had to be different, or was it the same? Uh, uh, sure uh, <laughs> well, it's it's. Uh... I've never thought about that okay. I mean, because I mean it, it it didn't feature very prominently in my in in okay. in, in life in oh, in life in America. You know, this is a small community, yeah. and I was working towards my PhD, looking at Islam in a very different light and right. developing in very different ways. But now that you ask the question, uh, the South Asian community of Detroit is somewhat different from South Asian communities elsewhere in America. Because they're highly educated and highly affluent, right. so they had no need to 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 aspire to being white. They were white in terms of their privileges. Uh, the South Asian community in South Africa was was uh, uh, lived a better standard of life than the African community, okay. but they were they remained second class citizens, right? So they they too had to struggle, uh, as opposed to to South Asians. In there was no struggle, if uh, at least in in being integrated. They went to the best schools. Uh, they enjoyed the standard of living that only five five percent of the white community enjoyed. They lived in the most affluent areas, and so so they they were as white as white could be. Mm. So now you, 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 you touched on and you alluded to the fact that you are now serving as imam, you're pursuing your PhD um, at the University of Michigan. Um, how different is that experience now, going back to the idea of studying Islam, right, than your previous studies? Uh, well, I was, uh, Western for academia. one, it was, it, was, uh, it was long distance. I had to drive all the way from, from uh, Troy to uh, Ann Arbor. to Ann Arbor, which is a good forty miles, and and, and so I was commuting at least twice a week. Uh, I was never part of the of the of the student fraternity, uh, and never quite. Uh, so I was deprived of the the uh, uh, the opportunities and 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 uh, 
the enriching uh, interactions that take place at that level. Right. Um, there was no time for me to, to attend uh, uh, talks uh, that took place, at least at, at a place like the University of Michigan, at almost a daily, on, on a daily basis. So I never got to do that. But, uh, but I did certainly uh, start looking at Islam uh, differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, more critically mm. uh, with the eye of a skeptic and uh, that that opened up a, a whole new uh, uh, a whole new window how so? well yeah, the, the, the basis for study of, of, of any religion not just Islam in academia is, is one in which you 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 uh, you uh, approach your area of study with an open mind, mm-hmm. and and you do so with uh, with a certain objectivity and impartiality, uh, which which obviously is 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 the the eye of a skeptic. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas when you enroll in an Islamic institution, then you're doing so f- for affirmation, confirmation, enrichment. Endorsement. Uh, it's never about uh, validate. Well, maybe validation. So your approach is very different. Which, I'm sorry, finish your point. No, no. Okay, no, I, because I, so and I, and I, I want to go here because we're going to go. I want to touch on this a little late, a little later. But by the time you even initiate and begin your PhD, you are already a traditional Adam in the sense of the word, and and. and 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 you, so, what was the impetus then to want to do the PhD? Was it that you wanted to pursue a career in academia, or was the fact that, uh, or or academia became attractive once you began your PhD? Well, I think I think it's probably true for most people who actually engage in a PhD, not quite knowing why they're doing this, mm. uh, and. Uh, so I was one of those, but I, I certainly uh, uh, saw uh, found, found the, the the PhD program attractive because so many of of of, of, of the uh, people that I considered my my intellectual mentors, uh, whom I, I may n- never have met, for instance, uh, Professor Fazlur Rahman of the University of Chicago, right? Uh, who who introduced me to an understanding of Islam that was so much broader. Than my train, my, than my studies elsewhere had had prepared me for. Uh, so I, so I, in a sense, I was, I was, I was walking in the footsteps of people like like Rahman and Farooqi and so on. Mm. Uh, not quite knowing that that there's there's a lot more to it than simply uh, understanding Islam from their perspective. It is, uh, it's not just understanding; it's approaching the study of religion. From a secular perspective, which uh, which is uh, which is an area that 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 the average person is quite unprepared for, for the very reasons that I mentioned five minutes ago. Right. I mean, and and I, I, again, this, literally by you mentioning Farooqi and Fazlur Rahman uh, has got me thinking about this question, but. There is this sort of old guard as it comes to, you know, people like Fazlur Rahman, Farooqi, maybe even Sayyid Hussein Nasser, who uh, have been, you know, in Western academia, as I'm saying Muslims in Western academia since like the 1950s, right, or the 1960s. And then, uh, but they were few and far between. That Those numbers grow exponentially like what you have now. Um, could you talk a little bit about, about just what, you know, people like Fazlur Rahman, Farooqi, Nasser represented with regards to Muslims and their relationship with Western academia, vis-à-vis the study of Islam. I don't know the extent to which Fazlur Rahman and, and, and Farooqi in particular mm-hmm. impacted Islam in America. Right. I don't know the extent to that. To that. I know they had, uh, they had a, a broad influence on Islam in the world at large, hmm. uh, uh, I, I I I say this because I'm I'm not convinced that that uh, those in academia uh, uh, 
have a particular influence on, on, on the community in America. Right. And that's one. And, and, and if this is something that is, if it is the case, then, then, then if it is something that's new, or this has always been the case. Uh, I'm told that Rahman used to have um, sessions, I don't know if it had pertained to tafsir or fiqh, with the community in Chicago. I've heard that too. Uh, but uh, there seems to be no, no impact, uh, which is not to say that academia has had no impact on the Muslim community. But it, it's it's a trickle down impact as opposed to a direct impact. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the difference is that uh, Rahman would have students who would then serve the community either directly or indirectly, and so that's this is what I mean by a trickle down, uh, as opposed to being a public intellectual who would be invited, for instance, to an Isna convention, or who would be who would be intimately involved in the educational program that is being prepared for South, uh, Southeast Michigan, someplace right. like that. Uh, so I don't know the extent to which they have or had that impact. Certainly being invited to give the Friday sermon or something. Well, I think that would work. be very unlikely. Right, that's right. So that's I'm, I, I, which is why I'm not even mentioning it, because it's, it's, it's the, the, the possibility of that occurring is remote. I'm talking right. about, yeah. and, and of course the influence would be also uh, remote. Right. I'm talking about a palpable influence that comes in via the avenues that academia usually uh, uses. Uh, I, I, to some extent, I think uh, in, in Judaism, there, is, there seems to be a, more, a greater influence of academics mm. on the general population. Uh, because, because those who, who pursue a, 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 a doctorate not everyone is 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 uh, looking to work in academia. Some really just go back to 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 to, to their to public service. Mm-hmm. That has has not been the case in in the Islamic community, right? Or the Catholics even, right? I mean, they they have their own. I mean, you, they go to Jesuit schools or so, what have you, get and they, PhDs and, uh, and, and graduate and then go back right into back the community. To the right. That has not been the case in the Muslim community. There are certainly some ulama who have graduated uh, with the PhDs, uh, but the PhD itself is so uh, misleading. Mm. Uh, those who graduate with PhDs from from some of the Muslim countries are, are just uh, ulama with with PhDs. They're not PhDs with PhDs. In other words, they don't have the, they don't have the eye of the skeptic. Right. They're not looking at religion objectively. Mm-hmm. There is not an impartial observation of their own tradition. Uh, it's 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 uh, they they fit in entirely into that category of that I described early on. Uh, they simply seek endorsement, affirmation, um, a greater understanding of their faith, but it's not a reexamination of of the the the, uh, the articles or the history or the traditions. Well, to that point, why do you think that that's such an integral part? Of, of sort of the experience is having that eye of the skeptic. What, why, what, what do you think makes that something that, that is important to have? Well, well, you can have a, the, the eye of the skeptic could either be a uh, partial or it could be total. Okay. So every Shia who examines Islam or Sunnism does so with the eye of, eye of, a, of a skeptic, if he's a scholar, that is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. If he's an ideologue, then, then, then he doesn't have the eye of the skeptic. Because he's not being impartial. Impartiality gives you the opportunity to weigh the pros and the cons, to look at that which is positive as well as negative. Right. An ideological perspective simply looks at something to seek affirmation of your own particular ideological stand or to debunk someone else's. <laughs> and so when a Sunni looks at a Shiite, from this, from from a, a, from a, the perspective of an academic, then he has to uh, he has to uh, uh, suppress or withhold his own Sunni beliefs in order to 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 give greater clarity to the to the belief system or the history, whatever it is that he is studying about about Shiism. Uh, if he wants to, if he wants to 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 conclude 
with an understanding that is balanced and 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 fair-minded. Uh, so we are all, in some sense, uh, looking at something other than ourselves with the eye of the skeptic. If you don't look at, at, at Muslim society with the eye of the skeptic, it's almost impossible for you to, to distinguish between, between the good and the bad, mm-hmm. uh, the, 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 that which has value and that which has no value. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and your religious training at an Islamic seminary does not quite equip you to do that. Mm. That, I think, is the key distinction between uh, gaining an academic understanding of Islam and gaining an, an, uh, a seminarian understanding of Islam. I like that better than, yeah, because we, we, when we were talking about where we wanted to lead the conversation, you know, we were talking about traditional scholarship and the role of traditional scholarship in America. But I think, you know, seeing it along the lines of semina- like, a, like a seminary trained uh, scholar versus an academically trained scholar uh, is the way I think is a better way to look at it. But um, within that context, then, um, w- w- you know, where do you see then the in terms of Muslim leadership emerging in America? Um, you know, if you, if you could speak about that within this context of of, 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 of you know, scholars that are trained in seminaries back home versus, you know, people who have training here or have received training here? Well, I, I, I think, I think ge- geography has less to do with it now because you have similar institutions in this country. So the, there is no back home. Back home is right here today. That's changed. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Been, it's been like that for the past 20 years. I mean, you've had, you have Darul Ulooms all over America today. I mean, you have them in, in the dozens. Uh, you have Islamic, you have Islamic universities. When 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 the Middle Easterners establish something, they call it Islamic universities. They 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 are ulums yeah. with with a a a a, uh, a Western gloss. Right. Uh, they're slightly more more accommodating, but basically, uh, the, the, uh, the the basic question you have to ask yourself is is uh, is is there is there the eye of the skeptic anywhere in this particular program? If there is, then you looked at the extent to which mm-hmm. that particular view is prevalent, okay. uh, and 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 that would tell you how academic an institution is, and 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 how seminarian it is. But in those twenty years, though, in terms of uh, I don't want to say legitimacy, but you know, okay, this person is a graduate of this prestigious university, or sorry, seminary from India or Pakistan or the Middle East. Versus these hundreds of or dozens of Darul Ulooms that exist here in America, don't you, has that changed? I, mean, I don't think that prestige applies any longer. I think if you look at the new crop of graduates yeah. who are serving the communities, right. it matters not to those who are who, who hire them, okay. to wh- wh- where they graduated. It sometimes says, "All right, he's a graduate of Dioban," but most people are no longer mm. looking for that kind of leadership. They're looking for someone who is articulate. And, and and comfortable. Okay. He must be able to speak the English language. Right. And he must be able, the youth in particular must be comfortable with him. Right. Uh, so the fact that he graduated in Medina, or he graduated in Indonesia, is I think it's all it's a, it's a very interesting transition. Mm-hmm. I think it's almost irrelevant. Right. Because now, you know, especially with with regards to the role of the imam. You know, the community almost is looking more for a person who has can, can can offer pastoral care and can do counseling in addition to being able to deliver a Friday sermon or to give a uh, you know a, 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 a talk on Islam uh, from the sources. Would you? Consider? I don't know that. Okay, that's not. I mean, you don't think that's changing in in the, in the Muslim community? Well, I mean, it, uh, I, I have to be candid. I don't spend as much time in this country as I as I used to. Right. So I, 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 I don't have uh, the information to, to, to draw that conclusion. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, can, you, can you talk about the, the sort of the tension between thinking critically about Islam versus uh, approaching things more dogmatically? You've, been addre- you've addressed it a little bit, uh, but 
what what do you see as as that uh, the application of of that going forward, uh, especially as as the Muslim community, what would the term be, sort of indigenizes mm. uh, it, to a greater degree here in America? I mean, how, what, what's um, how do we address that tension? Well, actually, before you do that, I mean, I I, I, I want to spend some time uh, because we have you here talking about talking about. Uh, the American Learning Institute of, 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 of for, 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 for Muslims, Alim, and your role with Alim, and uh, you know, and, and to talk about what Zaki asked you within the context of uh, what Alim's mission statement is, and what Alim seeks to do in the Muslim community. Yeah, Alim, Alim is uh, a, was an institution established uh, by youth actually, and. Uh, uh, to which we were invited, Dr. Jackson, uh, Sheikh Ali, and myself, uh, uh, to to address this very question of uh, of dealing with uh, with Islam, uh, both as as part of one's confession, as well as 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 something that is uh, open for discussion in the public sphere. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to remember that. Uh, Islam in particular and religion in general is looked at critically whether practitioners like it or not. Gone are the days when what you believed in was private and uh, what I would have to do is simply respect what you do or what you believe in. Uh, Muslims learn everything critical about their faith from the New York Times Mm-hmm. or the San Jose Chronicle, or whatever it's called out here. And, and, and the ulama, those who are traditionally qualified, are certainly Ill- ill-equipped to deal with it. Right. Uh, this, is, this is pervasive. It happens all the time. And when, when, when these articles appear in the newspapers or on air, then, then your first knee-jerk response would be to to write it off as just more Islamophobia. Right. Uh, but but over time, you, 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 you too are drawn into this kind of a critical approach to religion. And it says, well, I mean, is that really the case? Ultimately, we, we are an, a, a, a society of people who are inquisitive. We're inquiring. Mm. Uh, our educational system forces that upon us. We can't just accept things on, on good faith. We have to inquire. And, and, and so that, that, that inquiring mind then takes us into areas of Islam that we might not have gone into uh, if we had lived elsewhere. So you will, for instance, uh, read an article in the, in, in the Washington Post about how uh, muta is affecting uh, the AIDS problem in Iran, mm-hmm. hmm. which it is. And, and for the sake of our listeners, the muta is, is temporary marriage as practiced by Shiites, right. and uh, and that would that would then set you on a course of of critical thinking. And you're a devout Muslim who's uh, who eschews any critique of the faith. Mm. And here you find yourself asking, and you can do this safely because it is your faith and it's not. It's someone else's perspective on your faith and their practice of it. Shiites. Right, right. As a Sunni, from the vantage point of being a Sunni. Sure, sure. Um, So if you have the good fortune of having a a roommate who is Shiite, you can bounce these things off him. Right. Uh, And then you will listen to things that but that that you might perturb you. Uh, he might, for instance, throw this back and says, "Well, the companions of the Prophet that you love so much, they engaged in it, and the Prophet endorsed it, and that sets you on a path." And he says, "My God, really? I don't think so. I've never heard this thing. Right? This is just Shiite balderdash." <laughs> Until you check with an Imam who will tell you, "No, stay away from this person, right. because he's <laughs> leading you astray." Uh-huh. And that answer is not going to satisfy you because it's he's not, he's not addressing the issue. Right, he's leading you away from it. That's right. Uh, so you you get onto the internet, or you find someone else who is or is more candid, and then you engage in a conversation, and then you try and wrap your mind around something 
that was problematic and will probably remain problematic. So critical approaches to religion in general, critical approaches to Islam in particular, are unavoidable in the modern world. We understood that at Arlen. And if you want your child to pursue higher education in reputable universities, then you ought to understand that this is unavoidable. When you look at a class being offered <clears throat> in the life of the prophet, you would gravitate towards it in the hope, in the expectation that it's going to further enrich your faith. And the first week in class is like being slapped with a, with, a, with a baseball bat because you're suddenly exposed to some facts about the prophet, mm -hmm. about him having multiple wives, about marrying someone who was not even in her teens, about him engaging in all of these bloody wars. And so that, that, that shakes your faith at its very core. And sometimes your faith remains sh shaken. Mm -hmm. uh, or you find Adam. Right. Hmm. Uh, Adam is unique in that it, act, it, it addresses these issues front and center. Mm -hmm. It looks at, 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 at critical issues within the community or within the public sphere and then addresses that because uh, it understands full well that Muslims cannot insulate themselves from that. So, so a critical approach to Islam is something that you either undertake or it's something that overwhelms you. But in a country such as the United States, it is entirely unavoidable. So is the ideal then for the community to then prepare that young person so that by the time he or she gets to the university and, and, and you know, enrolls in that intro to Islam class or that, that life of the Prophet class, where they're not in that kind of a state of... It's very difficult to do that because, because uh, homes and, 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 and formative education right. is there to, enrich, to, to first of all inculcate faith, enrich faith, and consolidate faith. Right. So that's all done in the, in, at, at the formative period. What you can do is anticipate critique and, and address that. But it, it requires a certain subtlety that our community just doesn't have the resources to provide. Mm -hmm. Where you, 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 know, you need a, a, an approach to the teachings on the Quran, for instance, or the Hadith, or sectarianism, that anticipates that moment in that child's life when that child will be confronting uh, a, 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 a painful truth. Mm -hmm. hmm. So then the need for organizations like Alim, or Alim in particular, will always remain. Alim is a band-aid. I mean, it's, yeah. it's going to remain that way because it's, it, it inserts itself in your life at a critical moment when, 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 when the confessional elements of your faith are, challenged. Uh, are under scrutiny. Yeah. Uh, the idea would be for, for an educational system within the community uh, that would, like I said, it would, it would do everything that, you, that is supposed to be done initially, which is to inculcate faith, indoctrinations, in other words, uh, and, uh, and then enrich faith and, you know, sustain it, but also anticipate uh, those critical moments in that child's life when he or she will have to deal with women's issues in Islam. So how, you, right, so how does Alam do it differently than, you know, that, that class at the university? Uh, Alam does it differently in looking at it in a way that is uh, more sympathetic uh, to, to Islam. I mean, Alam certainly has, has uh, a particular bias here. Alam takes the facts and then varnishes it. Hmm. Okay. Do you understand? Uh, but it's it's not it's not uh, it's not by compromising those facts. It's so all facts can we use to serve a particular need. 
every fact is in fact used in that way. Facts don't stand alone, they're useless alone. They have to be applied in certain ways. So yes, the Prophet ﷺ married Aisha when she was very young, consummated the marriage according to some sources when he was 11. She was when she was 11. And, and, and that to an, uh, uh, the most devout Muslim mind is shocking. Right. Except if you understand that it is as much shocking as the fact that at least one in five of the kids who go to your classroom are in fact gay. Which is which is true for 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 America. That's right. It's the percentages, yeah. And it is not just shocking for people outside this country. Mm-hmm. It is shocking to the great grandparents of these very kids. If you had to if you had to rewind American history mm-hmm. to the forties and the fifties and drop this into American society that people are openly homosexual and gay, and that in fact the most protected species in American society today is the gay community, like it or not. Protected class. Yeah, yeah. yeah. interesting. Yeah. So that would be... Yeah, so so that, that mm-hmm. teaches the, the student yeah. an added dimension to, to, to human consciousness, that, 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 that we are able to, to, uh, to uh, uh, acclimate to social realities, to adjust to accept and adopt. I mean, the first time a young person who comes from a very devout Muslim Christian Judaic in the home is confronted with a homosexual, he finds it uh, awkward, obnoxious, shocking, outrageous. By the time he he meets the fifth gay, he says, well, you know, what's up, buddy, or whatever it is that people say. So that you know that that shows that that people have acclimated to this; they have adjusted. Right. And and so when Aisha marries the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was so before we get to that, people were outraged by what the Prophet did, but not by the fact that he married someone who's eleven years old or nine years old. Mm-hmm. That tells you a great deal about uh, the 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 social practices of Arabian society. Right. Correct. So he was very much within. The norms of that society. Right. What we find outrageous was certainly not outrageous for the Arabs. Of, of, of there were other things that were outrageous, for, like for him marrying marrying his, his, the, the wife of his of his adopted son. And the Quran makes reference to that. Correct. So this is how Alim deals with this. A professor in, 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 in even a, a devout Muslim professor in, in academia doesn't have that kind of latitude. Mm-hmm. Alim certainly has that. And in everything I've just explained, which is which is pretty much how Alim deals with these issues, none of the facts have been distorted. They've sem- simply be- been given a different perspective. Right. Right. So this is just one way in which Alim deals with the multiple challenges we face in this country. Without glossing over the facts and without... Right. So, uh, okay, and then, so, and then and Alim's been around for... Over 10 years now. That we're talking well, it's about almost 20 now. 20? Oh, wow. So we're talking hundreds of students who have gone through the, the yes, various yes. programs that Autumn awesome offers. Um, okay. Well, I mean, I think that uh, we'd like to thank you for being a guest. And yeah. Uh, we, we covered a lot of ground, right. and uh, definitely you, you helped illuminate uh, a lot of uh, questions that I'm sure people have in, in sort of new and interesting ways. So. Right. Well, this was a great experience for me as well, and I, it's wonderful what you guys do. And uh, I wish you all the best. Well, thank you so much. And um, is is do you have a website uh, that people can? I'm sure pe- people can Google your name and see uh, plenty of. But, uh, but I do want to point out that for people who want to know more about Alim, they should visit uh, alimprogram.org. And there's A L I M A L I M program dot org where they can find out not only information about uh, Dr. Fareed and some of the other instructors, but also some of the offerings and programming that uh, Alim does. Very cool. And um, that 
brings us to the end of right. another episode of uh, Diffused Congruence. That's right. And obviously, our listeners know where they can find us. They can find us on iTunes, on Stitcher Radio, uh, as well as our new Facebook page. That's right. Uh, if you haven't, please go out uh, and, and, and check out the Facebook page, like it, uh, share it with others. And, and also be sure to leave us a star rating and write us a review on iTunes. And... <laughs> And uh, we'd like to thank you for listening, and we'll look forward to joining you again next month. Thank you.